Of all the Melbourne underworld murders, it is the most intriguing and instructive. The setting was among the better-mannered streets in the suburb of Kew. Hiya, baby. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Good one. On a Saturday night in May last year, a pair of grandparents settled down with a drink and a smoke and a TV guide. Christine Hodson was the cheerful, house-proud wife of Terence Hodson, a career criminal. Yes. Yes. And made no excuses for it. Made no excuses. It should have been a happy time. Their daughter Nikki had given birth to her first child, Dylan. But there was strain. Terry Hodson was under protection, having turned police informant. My dad told me that he was a dead man walking, that he'd made a few mistakes, but these were mistakes that can't be rectified. Late that night, attackers managed to bypass extensive security measures and clinically execute the kneeling couple. Either he really, really did know them and trusted them and let them in, or it was professionals. Tonight, a story that speaks from the grave. Relying on important evidence, Hodson was unable to take to the witness box. His story is Victoria's secret, the long and morbid entanglement of organised crime and police corruption. It can seem like the set of a crime thriller. In the way the story of Melbourne crime is covered, you could wonder on occasions whether the blood on the streets is real. In the black sunglasses, shining cars and catwalk swagger of the crooks, you see glamour, excitement and even the pretense of honour. There they are, <laughs> Al Pacino and Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> That's what they reckon. <laughs> In contrast, the Hodsons, support cast members of the gangland saga, are living proof of crime's true and wretched dividends. Why are the photos like this? Because they're old. That's when we were in Perth. All Mandy and her daughter Sarah have left are pictures <laughs> and memories. It reminds me of an actor. These are of the family's early days in Perth, soon after arriving from England in 1974. We were spoiled. I mean, I went to a private girls' school. My brother went to a private boys' school, same as with my sister. And we, we had the best of everything. For one of our Christmas presents, we got a swimming pool when we were kids. And we've never known what it, it's like to want, ever. In the manner of the Arthur Daly-like Cockney Crim, Hodson had a range of businesses and run-ins with the law. Following a dispute over his car yard, in 1985 he landed in jail, but not for long. My dad escaped um, from jail, and so we had to go on the run. And um, that's how we came to Melbourne. He kind of absconded. When they landed in Melbourne in the late 1980s, the underworld was undergoing upheaval. Hodson was caught and jailed, where he made a host of new connections, advancing his criminal status. He was a, a businessman. He liked to be thought upon. Um, if he could make a dollar in stolen goods, he'd make a dollar in stolen goods. If he could make a dollar in drugs, he'd make a dollar in drugs. If he could 
selling guns, you name it. As long as there was a dollar there at the end of the day. An old order where police kept the peace by bending rules and breaking bones had not so much changed as evolved. Massive profits from an illegal drugs market gave rise to a new criminal class. Members of Melbourne's legal community signed on alongside building workers and bouncers, equipping themselves with submachine guns and other fashion accessories. New relationships were forged with a new order of police, who, as in Ned Kelly's time, were still referred to as the Jacks. Lagging, the old word for informing, not only survived as well, but became more fashionable. Crims aren't like they used to be. It's so much easier now, I think, to give up other people because they're too scared to go and do the, 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 the time. My dad used to say, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Terry Hodson, like a lot of crooks, proclaimed a loyalty to the old code that you don't lag on anyone. His kids say they were brought up under no illusions about how he made his money, but still with strict rules to follow. So he was the one that brought me up to say, well, you keep your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut, you don't get into trouble. The Hodsons found some of the trappings of gangster chic appealing. They loved the Hollywood characterizations. The Al Pacino Scarface movie was seen as a classic. What are you having for tea? That was it. What? What we just ate. Get fucked. What are you having for tea, baby? But for all that, Hodson was less the nightclub heavy as the suburban mobster. <laughs> Do I look really cute? He liked being home with his wife, kids, and now grandchildren. He was very affectionate. He always kissed and hugged us and told us that he loved us um, and tried to instill in us the importance of being honest. Adele, you little villain. My mum, well, she was just your mum. You know, your typical mum. She loved her husband, loved her kids. <laughs> <laughs> She put up with a lot over the years, I can well imagine, with my dad going to jail. So what was her attitude to your dad being a crook? Um, she loved him for who he was. So for all his faults, even if he was a crook, as I say, she may not have agreed with everything that he did, but she loved him and she'd stand by him. After moving to Kew around 1990, the Hodsons were familiar figures recognised as both unremarkable and likeable. I mean, some people you sort of got to like a little bit more than others, and I'd say that Chrissy was one of those that I actually liked a lot. They just came in, they threw some money at me and said, send my mum some flowers, please. You know, love, of course, always love. And uh, Terry was the same. I was trying to focus in on Molly. But the Hodsons were different. Their lifestyle continued to be underwritten by crime. I agree, 100%. Was she there? No. Yeah, and the children had all followed the path of their father. <laughs> That's a nice one. Nikki has faced a burglary charge. Mandy with a tea towel and a bucket. Mandy has been convicted of drug offences and Andrew of a range of crimes, including armed robbery. I've said no fucking cameras. <laughs> After years under a cloud, Victoria's drug investigation team is being scrapped with an internal corruption review recommending sweeping changes to clean out the squad. By the late 90s, the discovery of serious corruption in Victoria's drug squad led to a purge and the creation of a new MDID or Major Drugs Investigation Division. In the transition period, a purge on drug traffickers also occurred. When in 2001, Andrew and Mandy Hodson were arrested along with their father, 
leverage was applied to Terence Hodson to cooperate. And apparently that's when it all started because the police um, then came to my dad and said, well, if you do us a favour, we'll let your kids off. What uh, was your attitude towards your dad working with the police? And I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Weary of the prospect of returning to jail, Terence Hodson became registered informant number SCS4-390. His handler was an arresting officer, Detective Senior Constable David Michel. A later court would hear evidence that Michel then formed his own corrupt relationship with Hodson while secretly engaged in a sexual relationship with his daughter Mandy. They thought Dave in the beginning was really grouse because he was supposed to be doing favours, but I just had a funny feeling and I didn't like him. I even spat on him once and I told him to get fucked and I said, I even told him I didn't trust him. But unfortunately, I went against my own better judgment and started seeing him, but then he actually turned out to be not so bad, if you, if you like. These are fantastic. Yeah, I just get them. Some really special taste. <laughs> Look at that. that. I didn't even have to cook those. That's fantastic. Nikki Hodson did not hear the story of her sister allegedly teaming up with a cop until much later. And I just couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. I, as we were always been told, you know, one, you don't cross that line, and I suppose she took it a bit further. A further knot in an already tangled web was Nikki's own relationship with one of Melbourne's more famous crime figures, Peter Reid. When Peter Michael Reid arrived at the Supreme Court this morning, he made a cry familiar to most days of the five-month trial. I'm innocent! The 1986 bombing of Russell Street Police Headquarters made Reed an unwilling celebrity. Acquitted of the bombing, he was bitter about his dealings with police. His relationship with Terry Hodson was also fractious. Hodson more offended when he learned Reed was his new son-in-law. We found out through the hairdresser, they would say hairdressers always gossip, um, and that she was pregnant. The plot thickens further with the introduction of career criminal Mark Anthony Smith, who was arrested on a burglary charge with Peter Reed in 1999. Smith was closer to the Moran family, one of two major factions battling for supremacy in the drugs trade. Their main rival was a gang operating around this man, Carl Williams, and his father, George. I wouldn't describe myself as a criminal, no. I've, I've had uh, offences that I've been punished for, but uh, I wouldn't describe myself as a criminal, no way, you know. When Mark Smith was shot in December 2002, it was believed his assailant was a Williams associate. It's got rosy red cheeks, look now, yeah. Further tension was generated in the Hodson household after Smith and Reed discussed their suspicions about Hodson informing. So do you think your, your father might have ever given information against yourself and your husband? I don't know. That's a hard one and that's hurtful. There's a lot of things that go around in the media that you, you believe so much and you, you can't believe everything that you read. Um, I, I don't know, it, it's a tough one. It, it, it'd be hurtful if it was true. The next important character to come on the scene was this man, Detective Sergeant Paul Dale. 
As Detective Michel's crew boss, Dale also came to know Terry Hodson. According to both Mandy and Terry Hodson, upon instruction from Dale and Michel, mobile telephones were purchased from this store for the sake of their own personal business. Now, in hindsight, because I know what happened, it was so that they could communicate, so that they had clear lines, so that no one would be listening to them, because I set them up in bodgy names. Hodson would later tell of a series of meetings at local restaurants where corrupt deeds were planned. Hodson also told of giving Sergeant Dale $1,000 and lending him his pistol at a time when Dale was being investigated by internal affairs. He told of a meeting in this street where Michel warned him of dangers arising from the attention Dale was receiving from the so-called toe cutters. What we can also reveal is the reason for Internal Affairs' interest in Dale. They were worried that Dale might have had a dangerous and improper relationship with a key figure in the underworld. Doubts had arisen about the reliability of Dale's evidence when in mid-2003 the sergeant assisted Thomas Ivanovich, a member of the Williams crew, then facing a murder charge. What was more of a worry was that despite this being known to police, Dale went on managing Hodson, who went on informing on the Williams crew. Considering that those concerns came to light mid-2003, why did he continue to manage Hodson? It's a difficult question to, to answer. I mean, we, we had concerns about Hodson as an informant. Um, we had reviewed that quite thoroughly. The review had come up clean and we let the current arrangements continue on. With the benefit of hindsight, uh, we now understand that that was a bad decision on our part. Look, look. Oh, yes. At this stage, the Hodson children say they were not yet in on the full extent of their father's secret dealings with the cops, Nikki having heard only rumour. <laughs> Although her husband had warned her to keep her distance, after August 2003, that became difficult. Can we see you? When son Dylan was born, Nikki began to sneak over to show off the baby. <laughs> Towards the end, she came and we were all starting to become friends again. That's the sad part. Considering the new arrival, Terry Hodson had swapped his four-door car for daughter Nikki's two-door BMW. What would prove a dramatic day for all concerned was also a big day in Melbourne, the 2003 AFL Grand Final. According to Hodson, Dale and Michel had furnished him with inside information about a huge stash of drugs and money in a house at East Oakley, then under surveillance and about to be raided. The plan was to get in first. Hodson was told that only an unmanned surveillance camera was watching the house and that as long as they went in disguised, the job should be easy. Having already arrived in the BMW, he said at about 6.45 p.m., Michel arrived on his motorbike, telling him Dale could not be present. Hodson said following instructions he had brought appropriate tools including spray repellent in case there were guard dogs in the house. What they weren't to know was at least one person in the street was not a football fan. Local police were alerted and Michel and Hodson arrested at the scene. I remember him one day laughing with me or laughing at the situation. He said, it would have been the perfect crime, except for one thing, don't ever rob a house in a neighbourhood watch area.
Although he had not been present, Paul Dale was also arrested in connection with the burglary. One week later, Victoria Police Ethical Standards Department interviewed Hodson. At the same time, a call was traced between one of the mobiles Hodson used to talk to the police and a Thornbury phone box. Hodson said the anonymous caller advised him to stick together. Ethical standards in turn advised Hodson enter witness protection. He goes, I've been offered to go into witness protection and I won't do it unless everybody's prepared to come. And he asked my brother and sister and they said yes. And he asked me, he goes, will you come? And I said, no. I wasn't prepared to leave my husband. I love my husband. I love my son. I love my family, but I've made a life for myself. Hodson decided to cooperate with ESD, but stay at home. He and his wife spending more time indoors. Yeah, this is the front of the house. Now, there was a security door on there. The house was alarmed, as you can see. Here. Right here. ESD installed a further surveillance camera which monitored the one entrance down the driveway to an already well protected house. So you could see cars coming past, even at the night time. It would have been easier to escape from uh, Port Phillip Prison. You know, I mean, he had security cameras, um, he had grills on the windows, um, security doors. Um, he had two German Shepherd attack dogs. Um, he had his, uh, his Roscoe. In underworld parlance, the Roscoe is a pistol. In this case, Hodson's 45. If it was night time, it would never be far. He even used to take it out with him for dinner. Um, he'd carry it with him just in case. Um, uh, otherwise, yeah, if he sat in the TV room with my mum at night, it'd be right next to him. Anyone approaching the house would have to negotiate sensor lights, cameras, the fortified entrance, the dogs, then a further range of security doors. Terry and Christine kept mostly to the back of the house. Daughter Mandy now did most of their shopping. Do you want some cash from chili sauce? Oh, stop fucking irritating him. Oh, she's just irritating him. Irritate me, but don't fucking Dylan. Fucking irritating me. Fucking, I only get to see him occasionally. Inside the normally buoyant Harp Road home, the children watched the mood change. Mm -hmm. So he's laughing at me now. He knows it's good. As time got closer to him giving evidence in the court case against his two co-accused, that he would—he just became a worried man. He did. He um. Sorry. He aged. Dad. I wished I'd seen more or just paid more attention. In the end, they were prisoners in their own house. They couldn't go anywhere or do anything. Hodson's fear was not just of police. Having worked as a registered informant since 2001, he had lagged quite a few criminal mates. And by now, this was known. The confidential police information reports revealing who Hodson lagged were doing the rounds. Once that information had actually been leaked out that he was a police informer and was actually going to give evidence against um, Dave Meshul and Paul Dale, that I think it stepped up a notch. I think there was a lot of people that were running scared and they wanted to silence my dad. It was later established that straight after the East Oakley arrests and following a phone call from Michel, Paul Dale went to the Major Drugs Division officers. 
Victoria's new Office of Police Integrity commissioned Justice Tony Fitzgerald to inquire into the leaks. His report, while unable to precisely identify the source, waved a finger at Dale. So you're not saying Dale did it. What are you no, saying? No, I'm not saying that. I'm basically saying if you look at the facts, you'll see two things. There is the opportunity and there is motive. Do you agree that the leak may have contributed to the murders? That's obviously something that we have been very cognizant of right from the outset of the investigation uh, when we became aware of the fact that the information reports had been, had been leaked and were circulating in the underworld. Um, it's an obvious motive. Underworld patriarch George Williams was one of many to receive the reports. Oh, I don't know where it came from. I really can't remember. Uh, Someone might have poked it under my door, I don't know. So what's the point of poking something like that under the door? I mean, what's the value of it? Oh, you supposed to get your mind thinking or ticking over what's going on. You could be next, I don't know what, what the value is. There is no doubt the circulating reports further endangered Hodson. I do think it was calculated. I mean, I think there was also an element of uh, interest in certain quarters once they heard these were out there and tried to source them and examine them. But I think there was a, certainly a calculated dissemination in my view. Calculated, therefore, for what purpose? Well, to uh, with, with the purpose of, uh, of damaging Hodson. In March 2004, when a bottle was thrown down the driveway and a sensor light turned around, Hodson believed the perimeter was being tested. Fearing assault from above, he soared into the rafters to make it impossible for an attacker to climb on the roof. Hodson was in no doubt such an attack was imminent. We've snapped a nanny and granddad. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. Although still under a warning from her husband to be careful about her informant dad, oh, Nikki Hodson went on visiting the Harp Road home. I just want to munch you. You see, one day, just give me one big squeeze. I won't hurt Her dad doting on the baby he called the villain. Hello, Dilly. Villain. Please. Give five. Give me a high five. Friday, May 14, was the last time Nikki spoke to her parents. <laughs> I rang up Mum just to say hello and see how she was going and how Dad was going and she was asking me about Dylan and um, she was chirpy and really happy. And then Dad got on the phone and, Hi, babe, how are you? Video father and son. Yeah. Molly. Hello, baby. Get the hall, babe. I went round there on the Saturday afternoon, just sitting, chatting away, and he, um, as I said, he'd done his back, so he wasn't very manoeuvrable. Um, but it was, you know, it was just another Saturday afternoon. Actually, during the week, he'd rang me and asked me if um, my partner and I and Sarah would like to come for dinner on the Sunday. So we said yes. And then we double confirmed it on the Saturday. Uh, yeah, when I hung up the phone on him, he goes, oh, well, I'll see you tomorrow night, babe, for dinner. He didn't like grease. No, well, let's face it. He didn't like grease at all. Treat was all right. Yep. Yeah. Well, he loved London. My um, parents didn't keep office hours. They'd sit up and talk about their kids, probably more often than not about their kids. They'd sit around and drink and talk and maybe do a couple of lines of coke and they would just, that's it. The Hodsons, not your average grandparents, look forward to an average family Sunday. <laughs> Terry had prepared dinner. Christine sent a text message inviting Nikki. It was actually sent on the Saturday night at about quarter to nine and it said, hi babe. Dad's just cooked a butte casserole. Hope you and the villain can come down tomorrow. 
They were on the telephone again before 10 p.m. calling Andrew's house to ask about his son's football match. It seemed to be the last contact. Around midnight, one or more attackers, likely to have been known to Hodson, made it into the back room. Along the way, it appears, one of the dogs was stunned. Terence and Christine Hodson, while kneeling side by side, were each shot twice in the back of the head. The videotape, which had presumably recorded the arrival, was removed. All through the Sunday, various phone calls went unanswered. Then at dusk, Mandy Hodson made her way to the house. I finally decided that it was a bit strange that they weren't answering the phone. So I said to my daughter, I said, just wait a minute, I'm just going to go check on Nanny and Grandad and see, you know, that they're not too tragic and we're still coming for dinner. And I, I pulled up and there was my brother um, bringing out the rubbish, bringing out their bins, because I'd noticed that their garage door still wasn't open, which was unusual for them. She's just turned up and said, have you heard from Mum and Dad? And I said, no, I'll look, I've just got here. I'm just bringing the bins up because he's done his back. I said, can't come down. Well, you got the keys. I went to reach for the handle and it unlocked and I thought, oh, this is strange. I then, where they sit in their TV room, I looked in and I saw my dad lying on the floor with his, he was face down with his hands and I just thought that, that he was tricking and pretending to be asleep on the floor. I went to say something but then when I looked in through the, the security screen door that they had, I looked down and there was um, my mum lying next to him and I thought, well, my mum wouldn't lie on the floor pretending to be asleep and so I opened it up and I noticed the blood around my mum's head. So... bent down to touch my mum. Yet she was as cold as a block of ice. I, just, I couldn't touch my dad, but I knew that he was dead as well. So I rushed out and screamed and said to my brother, they're dead, they're dead, someone's killed them. I received the phone call at 6.30 um, from my sister saying, Nicola, she goes, Mum and Dad are dead. She goes, they've been shot. And I said, what? And she said, they're dead. She goes, Mum and Dad are dead. She goes, I've got to go. And she said, are you still there? And I said, yeah. And I hung up. And that's something that'll never, ever go away because I relive that phone call every day. I hear those words and they pierce my heart. The Melbourne underworld was hardly shocked by the development, although there was some debate about whether operating principles extended to the murder of a woman. What was your reaction to the Hodson murders? Oh, no reaction at all. It was, uh, he, he was uh, given a green light to, to sell drugs and uh, even though he was cooperating with the police, he was cooperating for his own benefit to sell drugs. 
I mean, it weren't, it weren't as so it was a crime for him to sell. It's a crime for everyone else to to sell drugs or that, but it weren't a crime for him to sell drugs. So he was fair game? He was fair, yes. In my opinion, if he's going to do something like that and, and keep on uh, going, he, what he's got is his uh, own responsibility. That's not knowing nothing about the man either. What about his I wife? Don't, I don't hear nothing good about him. What about his wife? Was she fair game? Well, I think his wife was in it with him. I don't know. It's very hard now. They've taken the actual buildings down that were here. So, no Andrew sorry. Hodson returning to the now vacant house is fatalistic I about the loss of his father, but bitter about the loss of his mum. I, I can't come to terms with why whoever it was, had to shoot my mum. My dad, he knew the rules, same as I knew the rules. He crossed the line, that's the, the risk that you run. She didn't deserve to die. It's right, my dad took risks in life and that was him. He was always a larrikin, he's always been a villain. He's, he, he chose to do it, but my mum did it out of pure love for him. In the Victoria Police, gangland victims numbers 26 and 27, Terence and Christine Hodson, was more of a shock. There was already sensitivity about the prospect of a link between police corruption and the murders. While there is no evidence to show police directly involved in this one, they were clearly in the background. Hodson had been arrested with two police officers whose information reports were leaked to the underworld. The point that we've made about the gangland killings and the point that I would continue to make is that we have not found an evidentiary link between the two. Now, um, we're looking and we're happy to look and we're happy to get information that confirms that there is a link. How do you characterise the prospective links between Melbourne's gangland murders and police corruption? Well, I think the same dynamics operate. Um, the gangland murders are, I suppose, uh, an example of unbridled market forces at work where uh, different factions might want to seek to gain an advantage at each other's expense and where a very opportunistic um, approach to capturing market share is trying to involve people who can be of assistance. So what is the likelihood that those individual fac factions had good police connections? It ought not to be discounted. Three weeks after the murders, in the absence of Hodson's evidence, charges against Detective Sergeant Paul Dale were dropped. Dale has denied any wrongdoing. Exercising discretionary power, Chief Commissioner Christine Nixon dismissed him. We can reveal that some of Terry Hodson's testimony had been corroborated and there was a belief Dale was party to the burglary. Furthermore, according to Vicpol, Dale's relationship with the Williams gang member Thomas Ivanovich was beyond the professional level. What about with Paul Dale's links to the Melbourne underworld? Have you got concerns there? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think based on what Mr Fitzgerald has found, based on other work that we've done, um, we do have concerns about the nature of his links. Charges stemming from the East Oakley matter remain against Detective Senior Constable Michel. The investigation into the Hodson murders is still proceeding. Oversighted by the Office of Police Integrity, and assisted by a $100,000 reward. A raid was conducted on the Queensland home of Mark Smith, a regular Hodson visitor. Smith was one of a group of Melbourne gangsters taking sanctuary from the underworld war. More information reports, or IRs, were recovered in Smith's home, naming him as another lagged by Hodson. I think uh, 
the, uh, the dissemination has been targeted. You know, individuals named on IRs have, uh, within the IRs have had those IRs disseminated to them. So uh, I think uh, that goes to show both the broadness and the depth, uh, breadth of the dissemination and also the targeted nature of them. The new Office of Police Integrity has embarked on a longitudinal study of police corruption in search of the ghosts that haunt the present. It has a look at the people who are in the force, who have been in the force, and who may have associated with other people in the force, and who have, in fact, be a nefarious, corrupt influence on other members. Trace their careers, trace their associations, look at the breeding grounds of corruption within the police force. Do you see a long-term pattern of protection by some Victoria police of key crime figures? Do you think that is in the history of Victoria? I think there is a history of uh, unhealthy relationship between a small number of police, and I make that point, I think it is a small number of police. I don't think this is a systemic, and I don't believe it's an issue where Victoria police per se has been protecting criminals in Victoria. Um, but I think there is a history of unhealthy relationships between a small number of police and organised crime figures here in Victoria. Somewhere in these shadow lands where crooks and cops have long done business may be the answer to Melbourne's latest murder mystery. We've done a lot of work. We've made quite some progress uh, since the double murder of the Hotsons but we've still got a long way to go. I suspect we'll get to a stage where we've got a very good idea as to what's actually happened. He was an informer for the police. For the Hodsons left behind and waiting, there is no hope of a happy ending. All I have in this world is my balls and my word, and I don't break them for no one. Do you understand? For them, the real world of the gangster turns out to be not so exciting. The real code of the underworld turns out to be universal deceit and treachery. And what in the end really mattered, love and family and life itself, was gone forever. My son doesn't get to see his grandparents. He doesn't get to feel the love that they had for him. And they, they worship the ground that he walked on. And that's, that's sad. There's not really much I can say. Um, just that people shouldn't take other people for granted because you really don't know when your number's up. And in a million years... I know the lifestyle that we had, um, maybe what it entailed, but I never imagined to find my mum and dad murdered in their lounge room <laughs> because they were to be just my mum and dad and they were grandparents. Getting to the end of this one is also important for the Victoria Police. Long considered the best in the land, the best at being both good and bad. It's not something we're going to shy away from. The reality is every police organisation has corruption. The important thing is that we are prepared to face up to it and deal with it. Going the full distance, wherever the evidence leads, might take them beyond the turning point they need. <laughs>